Welcome to Hope Church Goldthorpe for our online service this afternoon. This week is a bit special as we're hoping that it will be our last online only Sunday service for a while. We're preparing to meet in person again from next Sunday which is Easter Day. We're really grateful for everyone's patience with online services. If you've been viewing online but you'd like to join us to meet in person again from next week, a further details will be posted on our Facebook page. This Sunday is also a bit special because it's the last in our little series looking at the start of Isaiah's book in the Bible. We'll hear some words from chapter 8 in a minute, but let's begin with a prayer to commit our time together to the Lord. Loving Lord, we meet as your people around your word. Please help us, by your Holy Spirit, to hear your truth, so that we will know you better and love you more. Amen. Now, many people in Isaiah's day didn't want to listen to God's word, so they were trying to find out how to live in lots of other ways instead. But God's the one who made us and the only one who can keep us safe. So Isaiah says, consult God's instruction. If anyone does not speak according to this word, they have no light of dawn. If we don't live by trusting God and his words, it's like living life in the dark always, never turning to daytime. Imagine it, you wouldn't be able to find your breakfast or tie your shoelaces, but more importantly, will be lost in the whole of life if we live that way. So our first song reminds us of how awesome God's word is. Let's get ready to join in as the music starts. It's a light and a hammer, it's a fire and a sword It's the voice of the Father, the word of the Lord The blade of the Spirit can cut to the soul And God will use it It's a light and a hammer, it's a fire and a sword It's the voice of the Father, the word of the Lord The blade of the Spirit can cut to the soul And God will use it to make us whole
Many of you will know that this Sunday is also known as Palm Sunday, the Sunday before Easter. Children, this is a good time to listen up. Mary's going to help you, as well as the grown-ups, think a bit more about what, what Palm Sunday means now. Have you ever had to wait for something? Something really brilliant, like a birthday or a special holiday or maybe meeting up with someone you haven't seen for ages. At the beginning, it feels like the wait is going on and on and it's taking forever and you're looking forward and you think, is it ever going to come? Well, God's people knew a thing or two about waiting. They had been promised something totally brilliant. They had been promised a king, a special king sent by God, who was going to be rescuer. Now, in our services, we've been looking at the book of Isaiah in the Bible. And you can find some of those promises about that king in Isaiah. But God's people have been waiting quite a long time since then, about 700 years. So they had had quite a lot of time to think and wonder, hmm, what's that king going to be like? I reckon they thought he would be strong and powerful. And I think, well, we all know, don't we, that kings wear a crown and they have expensive clothes and they have a big army and ride a fancy horse. Yeah, I reckon that's what they thought he would be. Well, in our house today, it's a very special day. It's special because it's James's birthday. Happy birthday, James! <laughs> but do you know what? That's not the only reason today is special. Today is special for all of us because it's Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is the day that we especially remember the arrival of God's promised king into Jerusalem. So he's finally here. He's arrived. There's going to be a massive party. There'll be a parade. There's going to be singing and dancing in the streets. There's going to be this big army marching through. He's going to be riding this big horse and there's going to be doo -doo -doo -doo, trumpets. But hold on a minute. When Jesus arrived, in Jerusalem actually looked a bit different to that. In fact, it looked very different to that. He wasn't wearing a crown, there were no expensive clothes, there was no army. Should we have a read to see what it really looked like? Look, I've got my Bible here and we're going to read from the book of Mark, chapter 11, starting at verse 7. Are you ready? The disciples brought the baby donkey to Jesus. They put their coats on the baby donkey and Jesus sat on it. Many people spread their coats on the road, others cut branches in the fields and spread the branches on the road. Some of the people were walking ahead of Jesus, others were following him, all of them were shouting, praise God, God bless the one who comes in the name of the Lord. God bless the kingdom of our father David, that kingdom is coming. Praise to God in heaven. Wow, that's a bit interesting, isn't it? So there was no crown or fancy clothes. There were some people shouting, but there was no army marching through the streets. There was no big horse. There was just a baby donkey. And there were definitely no trumpets. It's a bit of a puzzle. It's not what we expected. But do you know what? The surprises don't end there. God's people expected the promised king to come and fix some of their problems. They expected him to fix the problem of those awful Romans who were ruling over them. And they expected him to fix their country, to make it great and important again. I wonder, what problems do you think that King Jesus should fix? Maybe it's the problem of Covid, so you can see your friends and your family again. Or maybe you want King Jesus to fix your brother or sister and stop them being so annoying. Or maybe you think Jesus should fix your pocket money so that you can buy as many toys as you want. Now, they're all interesting ideas, but do you know what? They're not the reason that King Jesus came. They're not the problems that King Jesus came to fix. 
Because do you know what? We've all got a bigger problem. Yeah, we've got an even bigger problem than any of those things. And it's called sin. Sin is when we reject God. We say, shove off God. I'm in charge. No to your rules. And it's a problem for all of us. It's a problem for me. It's a problem for all of the Hope Church grown-ups. And it's a problem for you. And the reason that it's our biggest problem, the reason it's so serious, is because it means we can't be friends with God. And that is really bad. But do you know what? There's good news. The good news is that King Jesus came to fix our biggest problem. King Jesus came to fix the problem of sin. How awesome is that? Jesus fixed the problem of sin so we can be friends with God. Brilliant. Now, maybe you'd like to hear a bit more. Why not come to our Easter Day service next week? Or if you can't wait till then, why not ask the grown-up who helped you tune in today? Or send us a message through Facebook if your grown-up says that's all right. But for now, let's remember how, although Jesus wasn't the king that any of us expected, he's so much better because he's the king that we need who fixes our biggest problem so we can be friends with God. Hooray for Jesus. If we really know who Jesus is, we should welcome him as king to rule over our lives. But if we're honest, we've not always lived the way Jesus wants us to, even in the past week. Now, he doesn't want us to pretend or hide our sin. He wants us to bring it to him, saying sorry so that we can receive his free forgiveness. Isn't that a wonderful thing? If you want to do that, please join in these words of confession. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the Bible encourages us to admit our many sins. God warns us not to hide them from him, but humbly to confess them so that he may forgive us through his never-ending goodness and mercy. Let us then draw near to him with confidence, saying together, Almighty and most merciful Father, we have wandered from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed our own thoughts and desires. We have not done the right things that we should have done, and we have continued to do wrong things. We admit that we have sinned and ask for your mercy. As you have promised, please forgive us through your Son, Jesus Christ, and help us each day to live godly and obedient lives that bring glory and honour to your holy name. Amen. Well, children, thank you for being with us so far. If you've got other things to do, um, you're welcome to leave at this point, uh, should you want to. Isaiah speaks these wise words in chapter 8. Do not fear what this people fear, he says, and do not dread it. The Lord Almighty is the one you are to regard as holy. He is the one you are to fear. He is the one you are to dread. The last 12 months or so have shown us, haven't they, that there's plenty in the world around us that can cause people to be afraid. But Isaiah reminds us that as believers in the Lord, we shouldn't live as if the world is a scary, out of control place. The Lord is this world's almighty ruler, even in what seems like chaos caused by the likes of coronavirus. The only way we can live securely is to fear him by putting our trust completely in him. 
Well, we're going to sing of the Lord's trustworthiness now in our next song. Chris Taylor, who's going to come and speak from God's Word to us shortly, uh, is going to give us our notices now. Well, good afternoon to you all as well. Um, if you've not been introduced, my name is Chris, and it's really good to welcome you uh, again to this uh, afternoon service. Um, those who um, are waiting for uh, their regular weekly update email uh, from me about things going on, then uh, later today that will be with you. But let me just share some other things uh, with, with us all uh, going on this week. Uh, firstly, if uh, you want to um, have a bit of time outside, especially over the coming few days of good weather, then uh, we have an Easter puzzle trail, uh, especially for families uh, around uh, Goldthorpe. Uh, do get in touch if you'd like a copy. It's also available on our Facebook page. Um, 
if you want to do something perhaps with children or grandchildren, if it's uh, safe for you to, to do that, then uh, you might have to uh, tune into the Easter Bake Along uh, run by an organisation called Faith in Kids. Uh, again, details have been on our uh, Facebook uh, page and get in touch if you want to do that. Uh, finding out about the story of Easter whilst uh, baking uh, uh, delicious chocolate brownies with, uh, with children. Uh, this week, our look up in lockdown sessions, looking through the Psalms, will we'll carry on. That's uh, on Tuesday and Wednesday at uh, 11 a.m. on Zoom. And your life group leaders, hopefully, have been in touch to let you know whether uh, your life group is happening this week or not. On Good Friday uh, at five o'clock in the afternoon, uh, we are going to have uh, an, uh, a Good Friday service. Uh, uh, it will be a, a service of uh, a reflection, uh, perhaps uh, more aimed uh, at, at adults. Uh, it's five o'clock at the, the old job centre uh, where we uh, currently hold our services uh, on, uh, on High Street. So five o'clock on Good Friday for uh, a service. That will be also streamed online for those who are unable to be there. And then on Easter Day, our service will be back at our usual time of 3.30. At 3.30, again, at the old job centre. Uh, it's now called It's a Dog's Life, by the way. Uh, and that's a, a, an all-age family service. And we'll include a celebration of the Lord's Supper as we meet back together face-to-face -face on Easter Day. Uh, just an advanced date as well. Uh, in the evening of Thursday, the 8th of April, uh, we're going to have our next uh, uh, whole church uh, meeting. Um, a chance to think about uh, uh, what's going on in life of the church, uh, a chance to be fueled with prayers uh, and to discuss how we might uh, continue to uh, grow the work of the Lord in Goldthorpe. As I said, uh, email will be coming out with more details about those things. Uh, and if you'd like to get in touch because you don't receive those regular emails, then please do let me know. I'm going to hand back to Simon now. Uh, for the next part of our service. It's our great privilege as believers in the Lord that we get to talk to him in prayer and we're going to spend some time doing that just now. Dear God, thank you for the Bible. Please help us for the Bible. And please help us and know with the Amen. Dear God, thank you for keeping Hope Church safe. Please help ch children in Tajikistan. They are not allowed to go to church. Please help the children that one day they can go to church. Please help the rulers of Tajikistan to do good. Dear God, thank you for everyone at Hope Church. Please help us to keep trusting you. Amen. Dear God, please help the people who do the Easter puzzle to, to learn about your rescue. Amen. Dear Father God, we pray for those today who are unwell. Please keep them safe and provide healing in mind and body. Please give courage, energy, stamina to those undergoing difficult treatments and to those caring for them. Thank you for the medics. Please give them wisdom as they make decisions. Amen. Loving Father, thank you for all you've been teaching us through Isaiah. Sometimes it hasn't been easy for us to hear your message of judgment. We don't like to think about our sin and the sin of others against you. And often we struggle with the fair judgment you tell us that sin deserves. But we thank you for the great news of hope Isaiah offers everyone. Thank you for Jesus and that through him we can be rescued from judgment and be transformed by your spirit into the holy people you want us to be. Please do that great work in us, even today. Amen.
We've already heard from Isaiah that we'll be like people living in continual darkness if we don't listen to what the Lord says and trust in his word. So we're going to do that just now. First we'll have our Bible reading from Isaiah chapter 8 and then Chris Taylor will help us consider what trusting the Lord and what he says looks like for us today. This is what the Lord says to me, with his strong hand upon me, warning me not to follow the way of the people. Do not call conspiracy everything this people calls a conspiracy. Do not fear what they fear and do not dread it. The Lord Almighty is the one you are to regard as holy. He is the one you are to fear. He is the one you are to dread. He will be a holy place for both Israel and Judah. He will be a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And for the people of Jerusalem, he will be a trap and a snare. Many of them will stumble. They will fall and be broken. They will be snared and captured. Bind up this testimony of warning and seal up God's instructions among my disciples. I will wait for the Lord, who is hiding his face from the descendants of Jacob. I will put my trust in him. Here am I. And the children the Lord has given me, we are the signs and the symbols in Israel from the Lord Almighty who dwells on Mount Zion. When someone tells you to consult mediums and spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Why consult the dead on behalf of the living? Consult God's instructions and the testimony of warning. If anyone does not speak according to this word, they will have no light of dawn. Distressed and hungry, they will roam through the land. When they are famished, they will become enraged and, looking upward, will curse their king and their god. Then they will look toward the earth and see only distress and darkness and fearful gloom. And they will be thrust into utter darkness. Let's uh, pray together again as we think about God's word to us. Heavenly Father, open our hearts to understand and respond to what you say in your living word to us now. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you might have uh, heard recently the story of Stephen Gill. Stephen Gill was a man who was walking on the beach in uh, Red Car a couple of uh, Saturdays ago when uh, he spotted uh, a girl in the water and he realised that well, she was actually screaming for help. Uh, he tells that he and another man, they didn't think twice, they just went to rescue her. They threw a rope to the child and actually ended up falling into the water themselves before managing to pull her to safety. The police later described him and the other man as heroes. They had seen a girl in desperate situation and in danger, and they had done something about it. Today in God's Word, we are going to find out about people who are in danger and in a desperate situation, and we're going to hear what the Lord has done to help and what we could do to also help. As uh, Simon mentioned earlier, uh, this is our last week looking at uh, Isaiah for now. It has been a challenge, hasn't it? Understanding this ancient uh, document, but uh, also it's been a challenge because of the ways it's lifted our eyes to see how holy and pure and wonderful our Lord God is. It's uh, been a challenge, but it's been, I hope, helpful and rewarding for us. Over the past few weeks, uh, one of the big things we've been thinking about is, is learning to trust the Lord God with all that we are. Remember, uh, putting our whole selves in his hands, not being awed by what seems impressive or immediate. And instead, remember drinking at the unstoppable stream of amazing grace. So I guess we've been thinking a lot, haven't we, uh, about why we should, should trust our God in the face of difficulties and threats. 
Well, this week, we're going to think a little bit more uh, about people around us who don't know and who uh, don't trust the Lord. I wonder if you uh, uh, remember how our, our, the passage starts uh, today that we looked at in verse 11 that Ted read for us. Have a look at verse 11 again. This is what the Lord says to me with his strong hand upon me, warning me not to follow the way of this people. God has a message for Isaiah here, and it's an important one. You know, like, a, like a parent putting a hand firmly on a child to, to emphasize a warning. God's strong hand comes with this message of warning. Don't follow the way of this people. You are not to be like them. They are different, and their way of life is different. And if you are one of the Lord's people today, then you also will be surrounded by people who are different, whose way of life is completely different. And so this passage today is going gonna, is gonna to help us with, with three things. It's going to help us to understand and feel what living without the Lord is like. It's going to help us to see that, that we will stand out if we trust the Lord. And, and that may not be easy. And it's going to encourage us to be a light in the darkness we see around us. Well, so first, let's, let's understand and feel what living without the Lord is like. And, and what this passage tells us is this, that people are desperate and in danger without the Lord. People are desperate and in danger without the Lord. They, they, they might not seem like it always, but people are desperate and in danger without the Lord. You see, verse 12 is about desperation. Do not call conspiracy everything this people calls conspiracy. Do not fear what they fear and do not dread it. You see, remember that the people are all around Isaiah. They were deeply afraid. They were terrified for, uh, of an invasion coming from the north. And it led them to, to panic and paranoia. And in their desperation, they, they came up with all kinds of suggestions and solutions to try and fix the situation. That's the idea of the conspiracy here. It's a human attempt to try and make sense of, of what's going on in our world. Because, you see, we like to know, don't we? we? We feel like we should have an explanation, especially when we face tragedy or, or threat. We can face those much more easily if we can answer the why question, if somehow we can link it to something bigger. So well, I think it's no surprise that the things like the, the QAnon conspiracy theory, if you've heard about that, have become more popular during this pandemic. But you see, really, everybody, whether you believe a so-called conspiracy theory or not, everybody is, is trying to make sense of the world and regain control in the face of fear. Perhaps you've heard many different explanations of COVID-19 or, or just different responses to the challenges we face. Well, today's passage highlights that underneath them all is fear and desperation, even in those who, who appear to be happy and may have lots of props to help them. Well, they do not have the thirst satisfying, unstoppable stream of God's provision. People without the Lord are desperate. If you're not convinced by that, well, then keep listening. We're going to return to that idea in a minute. But as well as being desperate, people are in danger. Look again with me at verses 14 to 15, the end of uh, yeah, uh, verses 14. But, but for both Israel and Judah, he, the Lord, will be a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And for the people of Jerusalem, he will be a trap and a snare. Many of them will stumble. They will fall and be broken. They will be snared and captured. 
imagine some uh, climbers uh, approaching a, a huge mountain rock face. It looks dangerous and difficult to climb. Let's go around the other side, some of the climbers say. It looks easier that way. But the lead mountaineer shakes his head. Go to the other side and, well, you'll end up meeting the fury of the mountain elements. Climbing this side will be much better. You see, it's sheltered from the wind and the snow. It will be a refuge for us from the weather. See, to some, God is a refuge. They know him. And at the end of the day, he is their safety. He alone can be trusted to make sense of the world. But to others, God is an obstacle, a threat. He's an annoyance, a difficulty. They won't look to him for help of answers. But what these verses warn us about is that, that how we approach God will determine how we experience him. And if, if we think him an obstacle and annoyance, that doesn't just mean he'll go away. No, then he'll really be an obstacle. One that trips us up and breaks us. Either now or in the future. You see, without the Lord, people are in danger. And we heard, didn't we, how chapter 8 ends with both desperation and danger. It ends, doesn't it, with a sad picture of what it's like for people who won't make God significant in their lives. Just check out verses 21, 22. Distressed and hungry, they will roam through the land, as it were. When they are famished, they will become enraged, looking upwards, will curse their king and their God. Then they look towards the earth and see only distress and darkness and fearful gloom, and they will be thrust into utter darkness. You see, if you ignore God's ways and his words, well, you may not realise it, but you shut the door to the only true meaning for all of life. You can certainly try to fill the emptiness, and there are plenty of fakes and substitutes to choose from, distracting yourself with entertainment, busying yourself with career, numbing the pain with alcohol, finding answers in conspiracy theories or, or spiritualists. But, you know, all of those are just human solutions looking towards the earth as our passage puts it. They do not tell the truth and they do not last. And when each of these props fail us, well, we're left angry at God, who we think has failed us. But worse than that, actually, we will find ourselves cut off from any light that might help us to see our way out of the darkness. And don't just take Isaiah's word for it. This is exactly what Jesus himself spoke about. See, so feel the desperate and dangerous situation that faces all those who will not put their trust in the Lord. And so as we feel that, you know, if that's what's happening all around us, well, then if we're Christians, then we're going to stick out. Let's think about this briefly next. You, you will stand out if you trust the Lord. You will stand out if you trust the Lord. Verse 13 says, the Lord Almighty is the one you are to regard as holy. He is the one you are to fear. He is the one you are to dread. He will be a holy place. The Lord makes it very clear here what should be different about his people. Instead of searching around for some human explanation or human solution for life, instead of living in fear, that, that everything you've built your life upon is going to be snatched away. Instead, we should regard the Lord Almighty as holy. That is, 
if I could put it this way, you know, make the Lord your significant other. In fact, more than that, make him your significant everything. Do you remember the vision Isaiah saw in chapter six, a vision of the, the holy, holy, holy God? God was, was high and, and lifted up. That is God, God is God is above us, different to us, greater, huger. He alone can make sense of our lives because he is life. He alone can bring guidance because he is wisdom. And so we dare not ignore God or overlook him. That's what it means to fear God. Dare to treat God as God. He's high, holy, lifted up. And you know the amazing thing is? Make a place for God as God. And you'll discover he's made a place for you. Beginning of verse 14, he will be a holy place, a safe place. Now that's important to know, isn't it? Because if, if we're going to live this out, it's not going to make us popular. You know, we've seen how Isaiah describes the people around. They're desperate and in danger. You know, the Lord is a rock that trips them up. He's a trap and a snare. And they're, they're angry at him because they think he owes them. And so we will stand out if we're Christians because we're not desperate. We're not scrabbling around trying to uh, put meaning into our lives or, or, or flitting from one thing to the next. No, actually, like Isaiah, we know that we have God's written word. We're not in the dark. Just look again at verses 19 and 20. When someone tells you to consult mediums and spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not the people inquire of their God? Why consult the dead on behalf of the living? Consult God's instruction and the testimony of warning. If anyone does not speak according to this word, they have no light of the Lord. We, we're not in the dark. We're not desperate or in danger. So with God's instruction, his word, living, living, giving us a solid truth to live by, we will stand out. I know from my own experience of getting it wrong lots and lots of the time that we have to be ready to stand out. I, I don't mean I don't mean ready for an argument or, or, or ready to get up on our soapbox. I just mean I think that we need to daily ready ourselves to be different. Because the, the temptation to, to blend in is a, is a strong one. But the, the daily readiness to be different is, is going to come on a moment by moment prayer to make the Lord our most significant everything. Then he will stand out as you trust him. But before we finish, there, there is one more thing. To say. You see, if the people around us are, are desperate and in danger, and if and if we stand out and we trust the Lord, well, then actually we have an opportunity. An opportunity to shine the light in the darkness. To shine the light in the darkness. We've seen just now how chapter eight ends with people in darkness. But just glance ahead a few verses. Chapter 9, verse 2. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Some of you may well recognize those words. They're famous words uh, from one of the most popular Christmas Bible readings. And we will return to this next chapter. Uh, of Isaiah in, in December, God willing. But these verses, they're, they're about Jesus. He, he's the one who came to bring light, the great light of God. 
See, the darkness will not have the last word in Isaiah. And darkness has not had the last word in a Christian believer's life. But Jesus Christ, the light of the world, has come into the world. And the darkness has not mastered him. Through the events that we're going to remember again this week, this Good Friday and Easter Day, through the, the death and resurrection of Jesus, he has brought us true light and therefore an end to our desperation and danger. And so here again is what I want to finish us with. Shine the light in the darkness. May it be that that darkness does not have the last word in the lives of those around us. Let's just finish with this. You see, the Apostle Peter, he, he has this passage, uh, as it were, in front of him. And, he, and this is what he takes from this passage in Isaiah. If you're able to flick there to 1 Peter chapter 3, then uh, do so. I'm sorry I don't have it available on the screen today. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 13. Uh, just have a listen to these words if you don't have it in front of you. 1 Peter 3, 13. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behaviour in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Do, do you see how Peter encourages us to shine the light of Jesus in the darkness. He says we're going to stand out if we trust God and, and do good. And that one's always be popular, just like it wasn't for Isaiah. But we mustn't fear that. Instead, we dare. Dare to treat Christ as Lord. And with him as our light, as the unstoppable stream of grace, as the end of desperation and danger. We with him firmly fixed as our most significant everything. For then we speak. We speak to those in darkness of the light that we know. We speak to those who are desperate of the hope that we have. We speak to those in danger of the only safe place. Why don't we pray together to do that? Our Father in heaven, we praise you that through the light of Jesus, you have brought an end to our darkness, our desperation and our danger. And we ask that we would make you our significant everything, that we would set you apart as holy. Minute by minute, hour by hour of our lives. And so would you cause us not to fear, but instead to speak to a world who similarly is in darkness, desperation and danger. May we bring the light of Jesus, for the glory of his name. Amen. Thanks, Chris, for bringing God's word to us. God doesn't want anyone to spend life floundering around, lost in darkness. And that's why he's spoken to us in his word. And it's why he sent his son into our dark and messy world to be the light of the world. As our final song we're going to sing now reminds us.
We're going to finish our online service with a prayer in a moment, but there's an opportunity to stay on and chat for a bit for those who are watching on Zoom after this, if you'd like to. Let's pray together now, though. Lord, we thank you for Jesus, the light who gives us life in a dark and sinful world. Please keep us trusting in him and walking in his light as we wait for the great day of his return. For we ask these things in his name. Amen. <laughs> 